Hi everyone, I'm Dana and welcome back to Inverter Always. This is episode five, I think now, of our Daikin VRVS install series. Today we're gonna be focusing on flaring, uh, purging with nitrogen while we're brazing, pulling a vacuum on our system so we can add refrigerant. Every VRVS system requires an additional refrigerant charge. So we're also gonna talk about how to calculate that additional refrigerant charge in today's video. If you guys enjoyed today's video, please click the like button below. And of course, as I always say if you haven't already please consider subscribing we're not going to talk about anything else in the intro because we have a lot of information to get into today you guys so let's just jump right in And before we get started today, you guys, of course, I must give you the disclaimer that you've heard in every video so far. This is not a factory authorized class. This is not a training of any kind. This is just me sharing my experience, sharing information from past in-person classes, sharing information from the installation and the operation manuals with you guys, the meat and potatoes, the important things, the do's, the do nots, things to consider, that sort of stuff. I want to make these videos helpful so that you guys can install VRVS and your projects may go as smooth as possible. All right, so as we get started here, you guys, the first thing I'd like to talk to you about is flaring. Uh, almost everything on VRVS, just like mini splits, is a flared connection. Your outdoor units are all flared connections. All your indoor units are flared connections. The only brazing you're really going to have to do are going to be on your RefNet Y branches and the FXTQ multi-positional air handler. That's pretty much the only brazing that you're going to be doing. Everything else is flared. So let's go ahead, let's talk about flares and let's knock that off right away. When you're doing a flare, it's really important that whatever flare block you are using, I don't really care if you're using the automated battery flare block or a hand crank flare block with a clutch. Um, I like to use just the cheapy aluminum Black Max flare blocks. It has a built-on depth gauge. It's got the clutch, but there's no sponsor in today's video because I haven't hit a thousand subscribers yet. So I can't have sponsors, but if I was going to use one, that's the one I would use. It really doesn't matter which one you use. What you need to make sure you do after you make the flare is use what's called a flare size gauge. It's a little pink tool. I'll put a picture of one up right now so you can see it that allows you to verify or confirm that the flare you made is the correct size. It's very important that that flare you make goes halfway into that flare size gauge and catches on a little ridge right in between, right in the middle of each of the notches. If it goes in and catches on that, you made a properly sized flare. If it goes all the way through the hole, your flare is too small. And if you can't fit it in, if you got to jank it around to try to, you know, cram it in, you made your flare too big. You're either making the correct size flare or you're not. If you don't make the correctly sized flare, what you want to do is cut off the flare. Now, in case you haven't noticed, your flare cutter, or sorry, your tubing cutter, typically has a little notch on the side. That little notch is for the flare, and that allows you to just cut the flare off so you're not wasting copper. Kind of a fun fact, not a super important fact, but a lot of people didn't know that. So cut off the flare, re-flare, Make sure you use that flare size gauge. In commercial, when we have, you know, two flares on each indoor unit and we've got 144 indoor units, there's a lot of potential for a leak. And at least in my market, we aren't required to cut the flares off and braze like you are in, say, Chicago. They got, at least from what I've heard, I could be wrong, so don't quote me on this, but I heard that they can't flare. They have to braze everything. So they got to cut off all the flares and then braze everything on. But over in my market in Seattle, we're not doing that. We are flaring. So you just have to make sure to make the correctly sized flare. That's step one. Step two is torque your flare. If you look in the installation instructions, I'll put a snippet up here on screen now, you see that every single size of copper has a torque spec range. You want to make sure you torque your flare to that spec range. Don't over tighten it. Don't under tighten it. If you under tighten the flare and it's not tight enough, it can leak. If you over tighten the flare, you can crack the flare and it will then leak again. 
Once you do all of your flares, then you need to obviously pressure test the system and make sure there's no leaks. When you're checking for leaks, okay, down the road, everything's connected, all the brazing's done, all the flaring's done. When you're checking for leaks, you do not want to use things like dish soap, uh, Dawn detergent soaps, because what happens is you're going to put the soap on the flare or on, on the braze joint, verify, okay, I see no leaks, and then you're going to wipe it off. Well, guess what? There's a residue that's left behind. That residue attracts moisture into the flare, uh, into the flare nut, I should say, freezes during operation, has the huge potential to freeze, I should say, and then can crack the flare nut, and then you have a leak. Since we're talking about flare nuts, it's important to use the factory flare nut that comes on the unit. Don't use the flare nut that comes on a pre-flared line set. If you buy a pre-flared line set with a flare nut already on it, the first thing you should be doing is cutting that sucker off. The flares are terrible from those line set manufacturers. Always make your own flare. And the flare nuts are much thinner, light-duty flares. If you compare a line set manufacturer's flare nut to a Daikin or a Mitsubishi or really any equipment manufacturer's factory flare nut they are much more robust heavy duty flare nuts use the ones that come on the units now let's talk about brazing when you're brazing and this should really go without saying you always need to purge with nitrogen some of you old timers that are used to traditional equipment and you're not purging with nitrogen you are contaminating the system period yeah sure maybe you put a filter dryer on great you're catching some of the stuff we don't use filter dryers on inverter products. We don't have any of that stuff. Every bit of brazing you do, if you're not offsetting the oxygen with nitrogen, you're gonna have oxidation occur. All the black crap that you see on the outside of your copper pipe when you're done with your torch is inside the pipe if you're not purging with nitrogen. You need to purge with nitrogen, period, end of story. And if you don't, expect to have problems. The smallest amount, I have a picture of this from somewhere. I'll put it up here if I can find it. The smallest amount of, of oxidation gets what that carbon buildup gets washed downstream the first time you operate the equipment. Where does it go? It gets stuck in a strainer, which then restricts refrigerant flow to your unit. Or if it makes it through the strainer, it gets stuck on the head of your EEV, your electronic expansion valve. Your electronic expansion valve is controlled within 2,000 positions within an, a one eighth inch opening. It's extremely precise control and the smallest amount of that carbon buildup that gets on the head of that EEV will cause that EEV, or I should say can definitely increase the risk of that EEV malfunctioning. And what happens is it either gets stuck in the open position and can't close, it can't seat properly, and that will cause flooding through the inner unit, which flooding through the inner unit can kill a compressor, or it isn't going to seat all the way. It'll try to close, but it'll be bleeding refrigerant through, which that can also cause problems to the compressor, or it's just not gonna modulate properly, which is just a superheat and subcool control issue, but still can cause issues with the compressor. So regardless, oh, and then it could be stuck closed. So you could just straight on have a closed valve and it's stuck, now it won't open. Well, now you're not getting any refrigerant through that indoor unit at all. It's starving. EEV on the board says 2,000 pulses. It's begging. It's starving. And now you have just a very unhappy customer. You got to either cut out the valve or you got to replace the head. And if you do that, the head is not covered under warranty. No one is going to give you a new head because you didn't purge with nitrogen, at least not in my market, maybe in other areas of the world, but not here. So please, please, please purge with nitrogen. It is inexpensive, at least in my market, and I'm in a very expensive market. So if it's inexpensive in my market, it should be inexpensive in yours. But you have to purge with nitrogen. Now, when it comes to purging, there's a humongous, humongous alert I need to give you guys. All the EEVs are manually cracked open from the factory, but if your electrician applies power to an indoor unit, that EEV immediately is driven shut. So whoever's installing this VRVS system needs to be aware of this and needs to communicate with the electrician. Don't apply power to any of my equipment until I'm completely done with the piping section. Purging, brazing, pressure test, evacuation, refrigerant addition. Then 
If you got to test your power connections, you can test your power connections. But until that point, you do not want that to happen. So what happens if the electrician lands power to an indoor unit? What do I do? Well, unfortunately, you're not SOL, but you're kind of SOL. The best thing to do if the electrician lands power to your indoor unit before you've completed all of your refrigeration piping is to stop what you're doing and do all of the electrical and do all of the communication wire first because there is a control sequence that you can do from the outdoor unit that then drives all the valves open on the system and locks the system out from operating so you can go back and do all the copper work second. So you're just installing things in the reverse order. In many retrofit applications, at least in the commercial world, we've actually had to do this intentionally because they had a backup system that had to operate, which required the VRF indoor units fans to operate. Long story, not for today, but it is possible. That is the, honestly, the, the simplest way to do it right. You can, in some cases, manually open the valves, but it depends on the indoor unit style because you have to have a particular valve type. Um, if it's a screw type, you can unscrew the EV coil off of the valve, which is a spring open valve. It just, you got to be careful when you're doing that, that kind of stuff. So it isn't the recommended approach, at least not for me. That's just my opinion. It's not a fact. You can do it however you want, but you want to make sure you're purging with nitrogen, period. So once you're brazed, once you're flared, all of your connections are done, everything's torqued, we're ready to do a pressure test. When you do your pressure test, it is best to do a pressure test at 550 PSI. Now, Daikin says if you're using the FXTQ air handler, which is the multi-position air handler, they only want the system pressure tested to 450 PSI. So many times we'll just do 450 PSI because in a residential application, we almost always have an air handler, at least a very large percentage of the time. So 450 PSI for how long? 24 hours. And this is, of course, where I get all of the lashback. Are you kidding me? How am I going to do this entire install in one day if I got a pressure test for 24 hours? If that's you, it's okay, man. Just relax. Just relax. You need to do a pressure test for as long as you can do a pressure test. We aren't just looking for leaks here. And I think this is where, at least until we have a discussion, where a lot of people get, you know, triggered. Let's just use that word, triggered. The reason that we want a extended pressure test is, yes, we're looking for leaks, but the evacuation will tell us if we have a leak, a small leak. We're also looking for component integrity. I can't tell you how many times I've had a line set fracture just on the roll, a bad line set from the factory, I guess. I don't know. But during the pressure test, two hours, three hours, four hours, the next morning in, psh, there goes the leak. So if I had not left the system on a pressure test for an extended period of time, then I wouldn't have found that, which means I would have pulled a vacuum, still wouldn't have found it because there was no leak yet. It, the leak occurred during the pressure test, which means I would have then added the refrigerant, started up the system, left the job site, and a day or two days or a month later, whenever the system was running at those higher pressures in the heat mode, ideally, so maybe it doesn't happen until next winter, boom, all of a sudden I have a leak. Regardless, I don't want that leak. I don't want to have to come back to the job site. Anytime you have to make a trip back to the job site, that is a margin killer. That's a budget killer. It costs a lot more for me to have to send a service tech back to the job site than if I could have just caught it during the pressure test and fixed it at that time. So how do I get an extended pressure test on a system without taking much longer to install that system? And this isn't always going to be ideal. It's not always going to work, but this is just an example. Okay, so bear with me here. Let's say you're doing a three ton one to one. You're going to replace an existing air handler, run a line set, mount the outdoor unit, and that's pretty much it. Like it's a pretty simple install. Okay, well, you can do that rough in in the morning, get the system on a pressure test, in the afternoon, leave and go to a different job. Maybe you're going to a different job. Maybe you're going to a service call. Maybe you're going to a different job and you're doing another install. Maybe you're roughing in an identical layout 
on a different home. I'm doing another one to one. Maybe this one's a four or a five ton, but I'm replacing an existing air handler. You can do two rough ends in one day and get them both on pressure test. The next day, the next morning, you go back to that first job. And granted, it hasn't been a full 24 hours, but it's been 15, 16, 18 hours. It's pretty dang close. And it's a lot better than a one hour pressure test or a 30 minute pressure test that frankly, honestly, doesn't even get up to the pressure we want it at. Now it's been at 450 for the whole afternoon, the whole evening, the early part of the morning. And now I'm going to go back to that job. Great. Held pressure. Do my evacuation, add my refrigerant, fire it off midday, go to the second job, repeat. So I'm still doing two jobs in two days. I'm not losing hours. It's not costing me more money, but I'm doing it right. That's just one example. Obviously, if I have multiple indoor units, any job, honestly, that has multiple indoor units should probably take longer than one day. Maybe there's a few rock stars out there that are just slam, bam, thank you, ma'am, and they're doing it in a day. Great. Good for you guys. But with this type of equipment, it's costing the homeowner more money. It's a premium solution. The controls are so much better. Why risk having a problem? I don't want a problem. Spend a little bit more time up front. Of course, time is money. We've talked about that before too. So you guys have to make that call and I'm not going to harp on it anymore. Regardless of how long you hold a pressure test, there is a trick in determining if you've had a pressure drop based on outdoor temperature. So whatever the temperature is outside, when you do your pressure test, take that temperature, write it down. Let's just say it's, I don't know, a hundred degrees out. You come back the next day or whenever, and you take another temperature reading. Maybe it was a week later. I don't know. Commercial jobs sit for months on pressure. Sometimes you come back. Now it's 90 degrees. The difference in the temperature times 0.8 is the pressure drop of nitrogen that gives you a pretty good indicator when you look at your gauges, whether or not you actually lost any nitrogen pressure during that test time frame. So if we were to do 100 minus 90, that's 10 degrees of difference in outdoor temperature times uh, 0.8. That's 8 PSI. It's a just a, a pin, a hairpin amount on your gauge. So your gauge shouldn't really look like it's moved much. But again, that's just an example. Obviously, if it was, you know, 100 when you did the test and 50 when you came back and it's a 50 degrees. I mean, that's a lot more than just 10 PSI. Now you're looking closer to, you know, 40 PSI, 50 PSI. You should be able to see that on your gauges. So just giving you guys that example. The most important thing though, is to ensure component integrity and of course, no leaks. And then after you do a pressure test, you need to pull a vacuum. Now, it is important to look out for two things when you're pulling a vacuum. The first thing, of course, is you don't want leaks. When you pull your vacuum down, we want you to get below 500 microns. I say we should say Daikin wants you to get below 500 microns. So guys will pull 400, guys will pull 300, 200, whatever you get to below 500 is great. And then you need to isolate the hoses and the vacuum pump and all that stuff off of the system so that your micron gauge can check the system's standing vacuum for decay. And what does decay mean? It means your micron level is going to rise. How much does your vacuum decay? It can't rise above 500 for one hour. So it is a one hour standing test. Now, a few things to think about here. Where are you connecting your micron gauge? Well, for starters, do you even have a micron gauge? A lot of guys don't have a micron gauge and they're looking at their normal manifold and just waiting for that needle to go into the green section or for the sound of the pump to change. And that's not pulling a proper vacuum for an inverter product. You need to stop doing that right now. Go buy a micron gauge and you need to hook up the micron gauge. So the next question should be, well, where am I hooking up the micron gauge? Do not put it on the T of your vacuum pump. That is not where you want that micron gauge. You want your micron gauge away from the vacuum pump. Some guys will put it on a isolation valve that they put near an indoor unit or a RefNet branch. 
and that's great you can do that no problem some guys will just put it on the schrader core removal tool at the stop valve of the outdoor unit which is also great the nice thing about both of those options is when you do your standing test you can isolate all your hoses your manifold the vacuum pump everything off so that you have fewer things that could interfere with the reading when you put it on one of your hoses or when you put it on your manifold now you're risking the manifold leaking the hose is leaking we don't want any of that get them off of the standing vacuum so now that you've got your micron gauge uh located properly we need to talk about the process for pulling the vacuum a lot of guys will turn on the vacuum pump and go to lunch go to a smoke break or leave it on overnight and then come back the next morning that happens a lot on commercial jobs and that's great and all but there is a chance albeit people will argue a very low chance which sure it is a low chance but it's still a chance and prior planning prevents piss poor performance i don't like taking chances i want to make sure that every single install is done properly so that i don't have callbacks because i don't want that callback that callback costs me money but there is a chance that moisture can freeze inside the line set so to do a proper vacuum or to do the best possible vacuum to ensure you have no non-condensables and to ensure you have no condensate in your refrigerant pipes because it's possible that there is some of that stuff in your refrigeration lines what you want to do is what's called a triple evacuation basically you're going to turn on your vacuum pump you're going to pull the system into a vacuum but you're not going to pull the system into a overly deep vacuum 1500 microns thousand microns not really that deep then you're going to purge with a little bit of nitrogen now you're not doing a pressure test you're just breaking the vacuum so if your vacuum is a thousand microns you put just a little bit of just a psh of nitrogen into the system to break atmospheric pressure so your gauges will be at 2 psi 3 psi 5 psi really not doing a pressure test here what that does though in the event that moisture froze inside your refrigerant lines it's going to break that up it's going to allow that moisture that solid form to then break back up into a gaseous state so that when you pull another vacuum the second time you pull you pull it a little bit deeper so maybe this time you pull it to 600 microns 500 microns whatever then you'd repeat this process you break that vacuum with a little bit of nitrogen and then you pull it a third time the third time you're going to pull it you're going to pull it down as deep as you can get it and here's where you're going to go 400 300 200 microns whatever you end up stopping at isn't really important as long as it's below 500 microns what you need to make sure though is during the standing test when you're looking and watching the decay let's say you brought it down to 200 microns and now you're doing your one hour test it can't rise, rise above 500 microns well, what if it goes 200 250 300 350 400 450 480 and then boom your one hour time's up technically it didn't rise above 500 but that decay rate was crazy sometimes it's worse than that sometimes it's really obvious and it's like 200 300 400 500 600 and then it goes past 500 if your vacuum is decaying that quickly within a one hour period it's definitely a good idea to break that vacuum one more time with nitrogen and yes pull it down a fourth time your vacuum shouldn't be decaying that fast if you pull a 200 micron vacuum at the end of one hour it might go up to 250 but it shouldn't be going to 300 350 400 450 that is decaying too much so of course even though it's within the guidelines use some interpolation to do your best work do your best quality work so you don't have the callback later it's worth the extra few minutes now than it will be later when you have to redo all of this after a repair is made there's one more step that we need to complete and that is adding refrigerant to the system it's crazy how often this gets missed guys are going from mini splits that are pre-charged for 20 feet 30 feet 50 feet whatever you name it to a vrf system that's not pre-charged for a certain amount of length now don't mistake that for there's no refrigerant in the outdoor unit the outdoor unit is pre-charged it's just not pre-charged with enough refrigerant 
to accommodate any amount of copper line set. So you need to be measuring the liquid line from the outdoor unit to the Y branch, from the Y branch to the first indoor unit, from the first Y branch to the second Y branch, second to third, third to fourth, etc. Measure all the liquid line in the system. Then what you're gonna do is take all the quarter inch liquid line, if you have any, and multiply that length, we'll just say 100 feet, by 0 0.015 pounds. Not ounces, pounds. And this also gets missed because guys going from the mini splits where you're measuring in ounces, we're now measuring in pounds. So take that 100 feet of quarter inch in this example times 0 0.015 pounds and write that down. Now we're going to take all of your three eighths and let's just say hypothetically, we also have 100 feet of three eighths installed in this example. You're gonna multiply that by 0 0.036 pounds, not ounces, pounds. Then you're gonna take those two numbers and you're gonna add them together. So you should have 3.6 pounds and 1.5 pounds, which should be 5.1 pounds. If the math in my head is correct, you need to add 5.1 pounds of refrigerant to this system. And the best time to add that refrigerant is right after you've completed your vacuum test. Why? Because the system is in a vacuum, which means it will suck in all of the refrigerant that you need to add from the bottle. You don't have to force it in. You don't have to pull it in with the system operating. It'll just pull it in because it's in a vacuum. It should pull in 5.1 pounds with no problem. Make sure you take your 410A bottle, tip it upside down, put it on the scale, purge your hoses. I can't stress that enough. How many times I've seen everybody follow all the steps and then right at the end, they don't purge the hose. What's in your hose before you purge it with that R410A? Non-condensables something else. It's not refrigerant. We don't want to put anything but the refrigerant into the system. So purge your hoses, then zero out the scale. Then you're going to add in the 5.1 pounds, close your hoses. You're done. You want to be really careful not to overcharge or undercharge the equipment. Don't guess at the line set length, measure it as you go and then write it down. It's really, really good to take the outdoor unit panel, and on the inside of that outdoor unit panel with a Sharpie, write down the length of each of your two pipe sizes, quarter and three eighths, and the calculation that you did and the total amount that you added along with the date that you added it. So the next guy up or the next lady up who comes out to service that system or do maintenance on that system knows what you added. Or even if you're going to be that person who comes out and it might not be a year or two years or five years later, you want that written down somewhere so that you know, because there are plenty of jobs out there, as I'm sure some of you have experienced, where, oh shoot, I did not measure my lines, and now I need to guess. Yeah, that's about 20 feet, and that's about 50 feet. Well, guess what? If you are over or under by more than 10%, and that is not a hard number, that is just a rough estimation, if you're overcharged or undercharged, by more than 10%, you're going to have operational problems. You're gonna have a lot more problems on the overcharged side, but you're definitely gonna have problems on the undercharged side as well. And the last thing you want is a damaged compressor or, or other issues. So make sure that you're properly charging the equipment. All right, you guys, so for today, that's gonna to be about it. If you guys have any questions, please put them in the comments below. I read all of your guys' comments and I always do my best to respond. I love your guys' interaction and engagement. So if there's something you're thinking, uh, chances are someone else is thinking that same thing. So don't hesitate, put your questions in the comments below so we can keep this discussion going. In next week's video, we're gonna be focused on the line voltage wiring and communication wiring, where to land it, how it gets ran. We'll talk about what a daisy chain is. So you guys, if you enjoyed today's video, please click the like button below. It really helps out my channel. Uh, as always, if you haven't already subscribed, please consider subscribing. I'm trying to get to a thousand subscribers, uh, get to that point, And then from there, just grow and grow and grow. Uh, inverter technology is a niche market within the HVAC world, which is a niche market on YouTube in general. So it is definitely a process, but I hope you guys are enjoying this series. Thank you so much for watching Inverter Always. I hope you guys all have an awesome day.